Welcome to this Think Cities uh, Roundtable, where today we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of rebalancing the economy. And I've got three great panellists to have that conversation with. I have Professor uh, Henry Overman from the London School of Economics and the director of the What Works Centre for Local Economic Growth. I've got Kitty Escher, who's the managing director of Tooley Street Research, and Ed Cox, who's the director of IPPR uh, North. And the obvious point is, I suppose, when we get into the debate, is that the calls to rebalance the economy are nothing new. And we've been talking about this issue for certainly at least 100 years, if not uh, longer. And certainly for the last 50 years, we're talking about you know, the imbalance of the economy. Um, but it does seem, at least to us, that the recent recession has reinvigorated and maybe reignited uh, this call, this demand to think again about the nature of uh, the national economy and how it plays out. You know, we've had the the Prime Minister and Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband and various commentators talking about um, the need to rebalance the economy and worries over London's uh, dominance. And I think whilst the rhetoric has been emotive and often charged, uh, some of the practicality, some of the details I think are often missing and I probably will get into some of that. Um, And I think the particular issue is often discussed more in private than in public is when we talk about rebalancing the economy Do we really need to start by the need to constrain uh, London, to shackle London? In a sense, that's the only way that we can ever move towards rebalancing the economy. I think we're going to get into that and uh, we'll have that discussion. So first off, Ed, before we get into the the meat of the conversation, just give us a second as to a lot of discussion about rebalancing the economy. Mm -hmm. What does it actually mean? You know, what do we mean by those terms? What's the, the parameters for the debate? Well, I think this is one of the problems that we've got with the debate is that people aren't very often too clear about how they define it. I remember um, came up to the North East, um, where we're based, and uh, just before the general election and used this term rebalancing the economy very specifically about a rebalancing between North and South. But since um, 2010, 2011, often the conversation has been about different kinds of rebalancing. So, for example the balance between manufacturing and services, in particular financial services, the balance between public sector jobs and private sector jobs, that's another type of rebalancing, the balance of trade, um, which at the moment is at an all-time terrible uh, low. So so these are all kind of different aspects of rebalancing, and ministers have different priorities. Mm -hmm. Um, They talk about different things. um, But but I think if if I was to sort of poke my neck out, I would say that we've kind of lost a bit of that spatial conversation, the north-south conversation, during the course of this government. And I would argue that's because it's the hardest bit to, to do and to, and, and to talk about. And that's why I'm really pleased that we're having this conversation. Yeah. I'd also say, I think it's a bit of a false choice. Right. If, you know, these different types of rebalancing, if we want to rebalance the economy between north and south, spatially, if you like, actually, that might imply a better balance yeah, of trade. It might imply yeah. more yeah. focus on manufacturing necessary than, than the service sector and so on and so forth. Yeah. So actually I think these things are interwoven together. Okay. Kitty, would you add anything to that in terms of just the broad debate and where we are with that? I think that's I think that's fair and it's um, I think it was very clear after the financial crisis that rebalancing started to mean less banking, more manufacturing, although the irony of that is manufacturing throughout the financial crisis and previously and now makes up a higher proportion of our economy than banking, although that gap is narrowing and manufacturing is uh, growing well. But I think what the North-South debate and the banking versus manufacturing debate have in common is that there's a sense of those from those who are not benefiting from the strong service sector jobs that London has, that somehow there's a bit of unfairness mm-hmm. in that, right. and there's a bit of you know, grumpiness about that, yeah. um, which makes it then harder to address head on, but it's very much there. Yeah. And Henry, I mean, anything to add to that, but also, I mean, if, we, if that's the terrain of the d- debate, just give us a second as to why we have the pattern of economic activity that we have in the UK, you know, since what's the economics that are under, underpinning some of this, and where, where does policy come into into that conversation. Okay, so I mean, the thing I suppose the thing I would add on the what is the debate about is that it, it's deeply frustrating because people aren't very precise. Yeah, and and the way I look at it, say around the geographical thing, is that you, you really want to be saying right, you know, what what are we trying to achieve? Where are we trying to do it? Uh, why? Yeah. Are we doing it, and how are we proposing to do it? Yeah. If you're not clear about those four things, 
a debate mm. around, <laughs> yeah. you know, something as nebulous as, as, as rebalancing. I mean, it just goes nowhere pretty fast. Yeah. So, you know, and I know we're going to get into yeah. some of those issues. I think you're right that, you know, in order to get into those issues, you have to start with an understanding of what causes those uh, spatial disparities. The way that generally I tell the story is that, you know, a couple of things have gone on. Uh, the first of these is that there has been a structural shift from manufacturing to services, notwithstanding where we are in terms of the, the yep. balance of these two things. <clears throat> and that the move towards services has shifted us back towards things that benefit from being in cities. So there's a sort of production side of the story that says cities have become more important. Mm -hmm. I think there's a consumption side of the story which says actually, you know, we've, we've sort of, one thing that public policy has got right is it's kind of improved the amenities and living environments in cities mm -hmm. but in many cities actually you know from a possibly from a low base but it's done a lot so cities have become better places to produce they've become better places to consume and at the same time that shift has tended to favor the high skilled over the low skilled I and mean, this is kitty's point that some people feel that they're uh, being missed out and the trouble is that these things tend to reinforce one another mm -hmm. so if you want to find somewhere in the uk that's doing well it's going to be doing higher end service activity with a concentration of high skilled workers producing nice amenities, restaurants etc for one another and if you want to find a place that's doing badly I'm afraid it'll have the opposite of that, it'll have a concentration of low skilled workers, it'll be at the lower end of the production distribution and it probably won't be generating those uh, nice amenities that, that, that help make life that little bit more enjoyable yeah. and so Henry's given us a sense of the I would call the work and the pleasure side of the, the economy, in a sense where people earn their money crudely, often sometimes where they spend it, production and consumption. It just gives, from your perspective, where does policy come in this? You know, what's, been, what's government been doing in terms of you know, responding to, uh, to these economic trends that, we, yeah. that Henry's outlined? Well, I think it's in the nature of um, agglomeration, to use that, that phrase, that that's, um, in, in some respects Henry's... Uh, begun to articulate in terms of the way in which things gather together and yeah. um, that you need to if you like oil the wheels to enable cities to, 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 to work um, and I don't want to diminish the importance of the market and the private sector and it's sort of incredibly important role in driving yeah. this but I think the public sector does have a role, government does have a role mm -hmm. in actually shaping the conditions if you like for the way in which cities develop whether that is through to pick up on skills, because Henry's mentioned on that, through the way in which the skills system works and the way in which the government has a role in, obviously, educating people, mm -hmm. training them uh, and supporting them into, into work. In things like infrastructure, you know, um, in, in you know, putting in the roads, putting in the railways, putting in the things that connect uh, the city within the city, but also between the cities yeah. uh, to enable these things um, to actually happen. And then on softer things, like its investment in... Um, research and development. Very often, I know, again, private sector is a sort of bigger part of it, but still, government can lever in um, private sector funding by putting in its own research and development money, uh, and that enables, um, if you like, certain cities to grow. I think that's where you start to get into some, some difficult questions about if, you, if we all recognise that the public sector does have a role then exactly how does it play that role and exactly where is the best place to spend your yeah. government pound, if you see what I mean, in order to promote and encourage yeah. growth. Okay. Well, well, we'll come on to that in a second sure. about you know, the, the, what does it matter and then maybe what we might do. But Katie, just I think, I any thoughts on me? I think this policy point is absolutely crucial and it comes back to Henry's four questions. We need to really understand why yeah. um, the public sector government should do anything. What is it we're actually trying to achieve? What is mm -hmm. the problem that we're, that we're trying to solve? Um, and I think the are possibly two ways into this. First, if you've got a government that thinks it's a good idea to continue to uh, pursue prosperity, um, then you've got London thriving already, and maybe you might have a view that other cities could thrive more, mm -hmm. in which case there may be a role for, for public policy to make that happen for the reasons that you say. Yeah. And then I think there's also a fairness point about access to opportunity. And it seems to me that there's a fundamental problem that if you've got a reasonable level of skills and drive, if, you, if your home happens to be in one part of the country, not another part of the country, then your opportunities are different. Um, and it may be you have to face starker choices about leaving your community behind in order to pursue work, which of course people have done since time yeah. uh, began. But if you happen to be you know, um, in a satellite 
um, you know, low skill town to a large city mm. rather than happening to be in zone two London, then it might be much harder for you to make yeah. those choices or obviously if you, if you live in a rural area. Yeah. And, then it's, and then it's about having opportunity everywhere. It doesn't have to be the same opportunity. Yeah. Um, and then it takes you into sort of debates about uh, cluster effects and you know, how you can make sure there are good professional services and other well-paid high skilled jobs available all over the country because yeah. otherwise it's just fundamentally yeah. unfair if some people can access them and others can't. Yeah, Henry, give me a perspective on that. I mean, does you know, Kitty's began to outline some of the issues why, from her perspective as to why this matters. Does it matter? And in what way does it? Well, you know, I, Kitty's, I mean, in some ways, I, I don't think there's anyone who would sit and say, oh, you know, this idea that we would like to create opportunities across the country. No, I, who could object to that? The problem is, I don't think we have the policy levers to counteract the strong market forces that make the, the location of those opportunities uneven. So, you know, I think that the, the problem that we're faced with is we've got these very, very strong market forces that are pulling lots of economic activity into particular locations. Uh, London and the South East is benefiting from this, but it's not just London and the South East, it's Newcastle relative to the wider North East region, it's Manchester relative to the wider North West region, it's Leeds relative to uh, the Yorkshire economy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you know, the, part of the problem is we then get a, ourselves into a situation where we say, well, you know, it's so unfair that we're not creating these opportunities in other parts of the region, and the problem is, I don't think we can. I mean, fundamentally, I don't think we have the policy levers in place that would allow us to create these opportunities everywhere and I think that's where the debate starts to uh, become quite difficult and where the sources of disagreement right. uh, probably are. Yeah, yeah well, I mean I, that, that, that is where I, I, yeah. I, I do disagree. So, yeah. I mean I, I agree with the broad point, I mean yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've said that already, you know, that the market is the dominant driver here yeah. and I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not trying to dispute that but I actually do think public policy can play mm -hmm. a role um, but as I say, particularly around skills, around infrastructure, and so on, um, you know, I, and 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 I and I think that if we're going to have a government that takes, uh, that has an economic policy at all, let alone a, a kind of regional economic policy, then it needs to, you know, in an evidence-based way. I'm not saying sort of just distribute cash willy-nilly, um, but it needs to, in an evidence-based way, say, okay, so what are the things that we could do to, um, if you like, encourage, create those opportunities. Um, in um, you know across across the country and not sort of throw up its hands and say oh we can't do anything therefore let's just go with the yeah. flow and I'll put it crudely and bluntly just yeah. plug all of our money into London because um, it's our home banker yeah. you know and I, I think we you know we, we we need to think very thoroughly and carefully about what those policy levers are that might make a difference yeah. and certainly that's what we can and then Kitty and then and then others but I mean, it, is that a conversation of then about particularly in a time of you know, diminishing resources on the public sector side, at, at least that, um, does that mean less for London and more for other places? Is it, I know it's maybe not as binary as that, but is that where we are in terms of it get, I mean, you hear this a lot in the sense of London gets X percent of, uh, of national budgets and it's disproportionate to population or it's disproportionate to, uh, you know, the size of, of the place vis-a-vis -vis other places. So does London need to get less and other places get more or, or is, is there more to it than that? I think that is a rather false choice and right. start, starts getting you down the kind of grumpiness route that I uh, <laughs> mentioned uh, earlier, which can be fun, yeah. but I don't know whether it's very useful. Okay. Um, but I, I think what I took from what Ed said is that um, what is, becomes immediately crucial is connections because um, if London is seen as so different from other places, then if it's very easy to get in and out of London, then suddenly London is near, because London is near in time, if it's not near in geography. And I think that applies to the whole network. So um, the way to grow is, one of the economic ways to grow is to connect to growing places. Yes. And so these barriers start to get eroded if you really invest an enormous amount in infrastructure. And that costs money, but it benefits everybody, because the less barriers there are to trade, the yeah. more you trade and the richer we all yeah. get. So it's, it seems very yeah. straightforward okay. uh, uh, to me. But it also, um, I guess, plays, it has, a, has another effect, which is one of the downsides 
to uh, residents and aspiring residents uh, in London of London's economic success is house prices. Mm -hmm. And so if you start making it a very real choice that you can live in your community but still access the jobs uh, in London, then you begin to see a policy way through some of this. And right. the same goes for other cities uh, as well. So yeah. it, I think this debate within a few minutes gets us to a conversation yeah. about, about intercity transport. Needs. Henry, who can reflect on that? Yeah, well, I, th I think, you know, one thing I would say is that I started my point today by saying that we need to get away from this idea that you can create opportunities everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, you know, this is often what politicians say. And then Ed did a trick, which many people in this debate do, which <laughs> suddenly made it imply that I think London is the only place <laughs> we could uh, generate uh, ep opportunities. And actually, yeah. I think that, you know, I was really careful in saying Newcastle, Leeds, yeah, sure. Manchester... I think that the, the thing that politicians really, really struggle with, and it's not surprising given their constituency base, is uh, really fronting up to this fact that we, we really probably can't create opportunities everywhere. I mean, looking at every town and city and uh, constituency across the country, we can't create opportunities for all of them. And then there comes a the question of, well, what should we do in a world where these opportunities are going to be unequally divided? I don't think that the story has to be... Um, no, we're going to put everything in London and the South East. London and South East are the only skin in the game. But I do think that it starts from a recognition that being able to generate these opportunities everywhere is something we can't do. And the reason why I push on this as being so incredibly important is because it does really influence the policy response. Um, so I'll give you know, a specific example, which is that sometimes when you talk to people about uh, going in and trying to improve educational outcomes for people in deprived communities, mm -hmm. which is something that I think policy should absolutely be trying to do. One of the responses that you get is people worry that these people will then move away. Mm. Now, you know, in a first best world, to use that sort of phrase that economists like to use, perhaps it would be great if we could educate these people and generate opportunities for them where they are. But surely a world in which we think, well, I'm going to come in, educate these people, and I'm realistic about the fact that the opportunities that I'm opening up to them might not be uh, in exactly where they are now. Then we get into a serious discussion about, well, what do we need to do to facilitate that? And that sort of brings us to Kitty's point, which is, yeah. if, uh, to, yeah, just to, to on. finish on that and then let Ed come in, yeah. which is to say, you know, then we do face this big question of the extent to which you can link up communities mm. with lots of transport investment, or you need people to move. Yeah. Now, and one of the things that I've consistently said on this again is that we tend to, in the political debate, favour the easier thing of suggesting that well, actually, let's link places in. Uh, at least your two organisations. But we'll link places into the more, and people will be able to commute from there, etc. And I don't know if that's possible. And that's the thing that's really, really difficult for people. Mm. Right. Specifically yeah, on. on that, um, we constantly bash on about skills being the number one thing, not mm. infrastructure. There's a great risk if you put infrastructure in without skills that you do mm. just drain people away. But, but I, can I can I just sort of point to? Uh, you know, a risk with Henry's argument because I, I, I don't disagree with it but yeah. I think there's some risks in it I completely agree that there are some places um, that won't be able to create the kind of opportunities that we might all want um, and we have to accept that I still think it's important that they understand their role in the economy and there's still a need mm. for a strategic plan for yeah. them and so on and so forth but I think the problem is we then kind of scale that argument up and when we talk about the respective roles of different cities to one another. Right. And I think there is a risk then that we have a national conversation about the national economy, which, if you like, scales up Henry's argument and says, well, actually, um, London is the place where all the action is happening, and therefore um, we shouldn't necessarily be investing in places which are patently never going to have the same levels of growth or productivity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And that includes, unfortunately, I know Henry's not saying this immediately, but that includes, unfortunately, places like Manchester and Leeds mm -hmm. and Liverpool, uh, where I think there is a legitimate uh, debate, particularly on the right, which says, actually, should we even be investing in those places? Yeah. My argument is, yes, we should, for precisely the agglomeration effects that we've recognised are so important happening in, um, in, in London. My question, then, is, to what extent are we, as a nation, properly um, sort of aligning our policy to enable that to happen mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's as simple as linking into London Kitty I mean I think I didn't say London I said City well but 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 you talked about linking yeah. into where the most growth was 
I want to see much better connectivity between the cities of the north oh, of yes. England. You know, I think that's absolutely key. Um, and when we are spending, and forgive me, I'm going to trot out my figures, but when we are spending, or when we are planning to spend, let yeah. me be absolutely yeah. explicit, um, you know, 85% of our um, transport infrastructure budget, budget in London and the South East uh, compared to poultry amounts um, in the north of England, we are not going to get those agglomeration effects that might um, enable the northern cities to fly. So and I, so I, and I don't, I don't think... Yeah, go on, go on, go on. Because I, I think what you've just done is got us into grumpy territory there, because what you did is, mm -hmm. you, is, you, is you took an overall number and then you divided it um, between London and northern yeah. cities and uh, implied that was a travesty and terribly unfair. Right? Yeah. What you didn't do is look at need and cost-benefit and effect. Now, I'm not saying... I'm not defending the decision, and I'm not saying that there shouldn't be more investment in mm -hmm. the north. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was MP for Burnley, we did loads of work around the yeah. northern way, which is exactly what you are talking about. Yeah. There's been some improvements yeah. uh, there. Mm. Um, and neither am I saying that you, we can't do more in London, but you, I think we immediately get into the wrong kind of debate when you use that type of tactic. But, 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 but sorry, so I, think, uh, so I also re respond yeah. by saying, I'm, I don't think by creating a transport link without skills, you drain people away. And this is something I've heard before. Oh, we, we wouldn't want a fast train to Manchester in case people leave. You know, that's totally ridiculous. No, no. What, what we have to do is you know, really believe in you know, people's sense of home and ownership and it, give them the tools to be able to develop their comparative advantage and be able to go out there into the UK economy marketplace and say, this is what we're for, this is what we want, this is what we think we can do, let us do it. Um, and then, you, then you've got a situation where places can grow on their own terms and the role of government should be to support that. Ed, I'll let you come back in a second. Henry, did you, want to, you wanted to come in? Well, I think, so I, I, I will just say that we don't want to have an argument about these spending type things because it, it does make you grumpy. But it also, you know, talking about our budget um, as if this is, you know, public sector, you know, someone in the Treasury deciding that 85% of the public sector budget will go into London, which is the way that makes it sound. This just is not true. I mean, what happens is that large amounts of private sector investment comes into transport, and it's the private sector investment that is incredibly unbalanced. And actually, in some ways, that brings me to the sort of point Kitty was pushing on there. I'm pleased to see your Treasury uh, background uh, coming through. Uh, <laughs> but it <laughs> is, you know, it is, uh, you know, aside from finding those numbers misleading, I do think that what you really, really have to get into is what you think that transport spending would bring mm -hmm. uh, and how um, making different decisions, what that would do uh, to growth patterns yeah. and how it would achieve something that's different. And one of the, you know, let me get to that. I mean, one of the things that I do find with this is that I do think that we tend to emphasise transport investment spending in places that whose economy is struggling as a solution to their problems, when I'm not sure the evidence suggests that it is, mm -hmm. actually. So, you know, if you took some of London's transport money and redistributed it out, or if you took it from some other budget and distributed it to places that were struggling on the economic side and provided them with more transport investment, I'm not saying it would do nothing, but I think it would do very little to address their problems. Okay. And many politicians have been there trying to push through transport schemes for their local place yeah. or whatever that don't deliver very much. And I think that's the thing of where you, know, you really do want to step away from the numbers someone and say, well, what do we think you know, are the policy levers that we could be pulling and actually spreading out transport expenditure, which is precisely not one of them. Yes, and I've said this publicly, you know, getting up transport expenditure in Manchester, Leeds, where congestion is starting to creep up as the economies are, uh, uh, are improving, Birmingham, maybe Newcastle, Bristol, thinking about possibly concentrating more transport infrastructure in those may well give us a good return. Um, but actually, just this sort of idea that we look at the figures and suggest we've got to spread this out everywhere. Yeah. So, I don't so this gets a little bit at this point around. I mean, I want, and I know you reluctant to be grumpy, uh, <laughs> which I admire. Uh, but you know, as, when we're thinking about um, scarce resources and how to allocate them, that often results in you know, or gets us into grumpy areas. And, and Ed, you were talking about you know, and Henry talking about making choices about where we deploy resource. Mm -hmm. Henry's talking about some of the bigger cities in the north as being potential areas that you would want to prioritise over others and then think about how you might um, relate those places to others. But there are choices to be made. And if we are, if the government, and some argue that they're not, but if the government was 
was is interested and is committed to rebalancing the economy, we're going to need to make some choices about what that looks like and how we prioritise investment outside of the southeast. So just just get into that a little bit more about you know what some of those choices need to be in places and of what sorts of investment. Well, I mean, I hope I can take us out of grumpy territory. Uh, it, but, uh, before I, before I do, I mean. I, just, I, I agree, of course, nobody sits there and says, oh, we're going to spend 85% of this budget or that budget or, or whatever. But we do have, I think, systemic problems with the decision-making that we have. So in, for, in the department, I'll, I'll move off transport, don't worry. But, <laughs> but, but in the department for transport, the yeah. way in which we do cost-benefit analysis is driven by um, user need and user wealth and, and yeah, so on. And, and, yeah. and if you use that, you don't then pick up on the wider economic benefits. And therefore, a scheme in one place does look much better than a scheme in another place. Okay. That's the problem. But that, and that's an example of kind of systemic problems within it. But to move on to the kind of bigger picture yeah. stuff, um, I'm not trying to play a grumpy it's unfair <laughs> argument I'm trying to play a look actually the whole national economy could thrive so much more if we were to get the growth that we would expect of our second tier cities if we compare them with other second tier cities elsewhere uh, in the developed world if we were to get that happening it would help the whole national economy it doesn't need to be mm. a zero sum game with London yeah. um, and, and we've argued very strongly that northern prosperity is national prosperity yeah. you get mm. some of those cities growing and yeah we can have a debate about how to do it but if you get some of those cities growing actually the pie becomes bigger and everybody everybody benefits. so that the, not, not exclusive but a, a significant lens for thinking about that debate in places is to think about Manchester and Leeds, because they are, in a sense, the bigger places, there is more activity going on. Previous research suggests, you know, that they are, as Henry was saying, are more productive and uh, than their, certainly than their, uh, their, the OECD their regions. Says, this but is a crucial point. The OECD says that they will grow faster than London. Um, right. and, 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 and if you look across, uh, you know, other European nations, uh, what we're seeing is investment in second tier cities is actually driving the recovery. Yeah. I, I would argue we are too dependent on London um, to, to drive our economy. Yeah. And we go back into the other kinds of rebalancing here as well. If we want a strong, sustainable, healthy economy, we've actually, um, it's not knocking London, it's about getting those other cities okay. up to speed. Right. So this, okay, so this, gonna, is, yeah. this comes back to what you're trying to do with policy. I mean, if what you say is true, which intrinsically feels right and very exciting, um, then what the policymakers should be saying is the big cities outside London have not realised their potential. Yeah. There needs to be public action in order to enable them to do so. So our spending there is about regeneration and development and you know growing that, that economy. Public policy debate in London is, whoa, this is one of the most dynamic parts of the globe. <laughs> there are you know capacity issues yeah. um, as a result of that. You know mm -hmm. there are there are parts of London where you know you, you can't get a job very easily uh, unless you're a graduate. You, you know so there's a very sort of stark divide, and that and that requires uh, resource uh, as well. So the public policy um, aims are rather different. Um, and when we start talking in those ways, that feels great because of mm -hmm. course there are people living in all of these places. And so what we need to do is articulate what our policy goals are. And then it's just a matter of making choice based on cost-benefit analyses. But I completely accept that it, it feels intuitive that more can be done in the cities outside London. And that is very exciting and benefits not only people in those cities, but those living nearby who could commute in, which is why I think actually it's very important to get the sort of radial and commuter transport links going, so because then we can widen the okay. impact. So more could be done, Henry. Which cities and, and what, I suppose, would be? Well, I think this is, this is the really interesting thing about this. So unlike that, I don't take a strong position on whether growth in London or growth in some of our second tier cities would be better for growth as a whole. Hmm. I mean, you know, if we I don't believe anyone can know the answer to that question. Would we be better off going for growth in London and the South East or going for growth in some of our second tier cities? I don't think we know. Economically better. Economically better off. Yeah. I think what we do know is that politically, for all kinds of reasons, we need to try and generate growth outside of uh, London and the South East. And, uh, you know, and then the question is how we go about delivering that. Now, my feeling is that the way we go about delivering that is not all of the second tier cities. Right. Again, it's this fact that if you're going to go outside, I'm afraid, it's this, it's again this idea that we can create opportunities everywhere. So it's one of the I'm problems not that the... That, just to be clear. No, 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 it's actually yeah. this is yeah. a point yeah. for yeah. sort of things yeah. outside yeah. this room. If, yeah. you, if you look at sort of say what the core cities 
uh, agenda sort of gets themselves. But they've all, they were always slightly hobbled by the fact that, oh, you know, all, all, all eight of us, or yeah, ten yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. Many, all of us. Okay. And actually, I think that moves people away from having to make some of the really tough decisions that there are out there. And this is why, you know, for example, one of the reasons why I was so supportive of, say, Manchester uh, and its independent economic review and the decision to get the uh, fund, uh, rolling transport fund going there. Because it does seem to me that the evidence says, well, yes, that's maybe, you know, maybe that is one of the places where we could drive growth. And that driving growth there, I'm fairly comfortable with saying, probably wouldn't have a massive impact on overall growth, right? So even if it's the sort of second best thing to do to drive growth outside of London, driving it in Manchester Leeds really wouldn't cost us very much and meets massive political and other objectives. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do it. But then it will still require these difficult decisions. So, you, and you know, I push this again and again. It says that, for example, you know, when you are thinking about transport infrastructure spending or science spending yeah. or heaven forbid arts and culture, actually, mm. eighty percent yeah. in London. But, 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 yeah. but you know, you wouldn't be jam spreading it everywhere. Everywhere, mm -hmm. and actually, one of the things you really notice when you get outside, if you ever look, say, at the lottery funding, let's actually look at the lottery funding. The interesting thing is, in London, the South East, the big lottery money for the for the cultural type projects comes into London, and people in Reading don't say, "Oh my goodness, that's terribly unfair." You know, London has got this museum. I haven't. They just think, "Well, we'll get on the train and go to the fantastic resources." Once you get outside of London, the South East, it's not just about getting lower expenditure. It's that we do one museum here and one museum there, and one museum there, and we do it with science spending as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't sort of say, it's Daresbury. Daresbury's our second science poll. We're going to go for Daresbury. We understand that this involves perhaps some compromises relative to the Golden Triangle, but we're going to go to it. No, because then it's unfair on Sheffield, or it's unfair on, you know, life sciences on Newcastle, or et cetera, et cetera. And I think that having some recognition mm -hmm. of the fact that we're going to go to specific places... Yeah. And really drive it. Can, can I get, into, into, can I get yeah. into the kind of leadership issue? Around yeah, well, that, that was going to be. So, yeah. my next question, I suppose, in a sense, the obvious follow on is you know, if we think about those big cities, and yeah. do they have the assets, the powers, the leadership, the will almost yeah. to, you know, to go for growth if, if growth was on offer or if policy was actually being more targeted in one place mm -hmm. more than another? You know, what's the appetite and the ability and the, the assets there in different places? Uh, well, I think there's a yes and no, and it's, it's, yeah. it's a fairly. Your particular question is a fairly sophisticated answer. Yeah. I mean, I think some. If we're talking now about some decentralisation of decision making, some additional resources um, to to certain cities, I think there's a there's definitely a, a yes answer which says. Um, there are some cities that are ready for that. They form combined authorities. They've got relatively mm. half decent LEPs. They can get on and, and start to deal with deal with some of that. And therefore, we must do it. That's the yes answer. I think the no answer picks up on sort of Henry's, um, you know, repeated point, which is right, which is to say we can't spread things absolutely everywhere. There needs to be some tough decision making. And I think if we look at what is happening in London with the mayor of London, if we look at what's happening in Scotland um, with the Scottish National Party, and and you know. A, 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 you know, a, a, a much more powerful Scotland. Yeah, you have got strong leaders there who are articulating a case, knocking heads together locally, saying, "Sorry, you won't. Not everybody's going to get this, but this is where we're going to invest," and so on, and making some really bold strategic economic decisions. The problem is the rest of the country is divvied up across what thirty nine. Leps, and that is just too many. And yeah. of course, you're going to get this argument about fairness rather than economic strategy. Our case uh, there is that we've got to see greater collaboration between places. We would argue that we need a strong northern voice. Mm. How we form it, we've got various ideas as to how you would do that. But at least you'd want to get Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds all of a, you know, in one dialogue. We treat the whole area as a kind of metro region um, with a, with a single voice and being able to play powerfully into yeah. a national economic debate. So the answer to your question is no, we haven't got that kind of leadership yeah. and I would love to see that come about but there are sort of fairly strong vested interests and sort of sense of parochialism even at the yeah. Greater Manchester level for example that actually mitigate against that but we've got to get that happening over the next 10 years in order to have the proper dialogue with London, uh, when I say London I mean Whitehall, Westminster 
um, and for that matter, yes. the mayor, uh, to be able to uh, change things around. Yes. And clearly, as, as a former HMT uh, uh, politician, and as you say, you know, once you've been in there, you never, you never leave it, as it were. I mean. What, what would win the argument? I mean, in a sense, you know, what Ed was saying about places coming together, being able to articulate their, their willingness to make tough choices to say it's here rather than there. I mean, does, would, is that going to win the argument with HMT and other departments of government to loosen the reins a little bit? Oh, uh, thankfully, that question is way above my wow. uh, pay grade. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the point about having a really strong united voice, yes. I, I think, is really important. Yeah. Um, the extent to which it has an effect just depends to the extent to which it competes with all the other strong voices, right. I would guess. Um, yeah. But I think it would be very positive. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, even where there isn't capacity, often giving people power creates capacity. Yeah. Um, and so there should be a general presumption to yeah. uh, devolve in terms of the ability to represent. I don't think that necessarily means elected mayors everywhere. It just means structures that right. enable voices to, to come together in a yeah. professional and, you know, articulate way. Yeah. Because if a place says, this is what we want to be, and that is accommodated and understood and programmed into planning and you know when resources allow yeah. and you know coalitions formed um, then it's much harder for that place to say oh it's all terribly unfair because yeah. actually they've been given the opportunity to do something uh, about it and yeah. I think that's that's very powerful so let's let's uh, begin to wind up uh, get some final reflections from you i suppose you know going back to where you started uh, henry many respects you know on the economic side if we think about you know the nature of the UK economy over the next few years, and you know even a bit longer. You know what do we envisage happening around our cities, and you know the forces of agglomeration. Where do we do we see essentially London getting ever bigger, and will it ever get too big? You know we had a converse, uh, a question in via Twitter saying actually London is too big, or will get too big, and actually the disbenefits will be uh, will outweigh the the benefits. And do we? I mean, what do you see when you look into the 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 crystal ball in terms of the economics? Um, I think, you, I mean, it's, I don't do forward predictions because no. <laughs> uh, I think it gets you in a terrible mess. I think that, you know, if you look at those economic forces I brought up at the beginning, yeah. at least for the foreseeable future, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, those forces seem to be pointing towards the fact that we will have a urban system of production that has you know, a, a relatively few set of places being the thing that is really driving the economy. I don't think that's going to change. I think that the thing that could change, interestingly, is around governance uh, and, and things that, that happen in that, you know, the, way, the way we make decisions. I mean, there the does seem to be an appetite for localism and I, don't, I think it's more than just lip service. I think that, you know, it, it's, it's been slightly more in the blood of the coalition than it ever was in Labour. And I think that Labour have responded to that by actually, you know, now I think they start to see the case uh, a bit more than they do. I mean, the interesting thing will be to see whether that aspect of it makes uh, any difference. I mean, I am less optimistic than, than I know that, that you two have been in the past. I don't think governance per se does very much. Uh, the interesting thing is that I think that the process that we're going through at the moment is, is, is interesting because it's interacting with governance. It's probably, there's probably some pressure to get governance a bit better locally. The really interesting thing, though, will be whether or not, once we start doing things like growth deals, the central government in its negotiations are willing to punish places that haven't got their act together. Mm. Uh, because, of course, that, if we had proper system of local government finance, is what would happen if places were not being governed well, not making good mm -hmm. decisions. The places that Ed was sort of mentioning that have got their act together would be rewarded with the fact that they would generate business and people would be wanting to go there and good public services and funds would follow, mm -hmm. etc. So I think that you know, the really interesting things with where we're going are actually possibly in that space around the localism agenda and governance. And I think the crucial extent to which it will make any difference is the extent to which in the immediate future, government holds its nerve mm. and really rewards the places that have got their governance and their local economic strategies together. Yeah. And I think longer run, more fundamentally, uh, it will matter if we get proper localism, where you get tax reform, yeah. plus allowing places to experiment and innovate and true sort of localism and, and, and experimentation at the local level, mm. which, which that allows. And if we bring that, you know, the story could change, actually, over the next 
uh, 10, 15 years, but I don't think the economic yeah. forces are going to very much. I think I broadly agree with Henry, but I, I would say that um, there's going to be some riskier decisions that have to be taken in order for that to happen. And I think the, you know, the next government has got a re some really big judgment, of course, because I think if you're going to get the kind of decentralisation that Henry is talking about, which includes fiscal decentralisation, we're actually going to see a widening of the gap between London and the rest in the short term. But I would argue that's a price worth paying okay. in, mm. for, for the lot for the longer okay. term, mm. um, because I think what London is demanding around, you know, London Finance Commission asks around certain fiscal mm -hmm. autonomy. Actually, that is what everywhere else needs, and the only way we're going to get it is to let London have it as well. Yeah. And so I think we have to risk actually a widening of the gap. I think that the sort of the, the, the seeds of London's downfall, if you like, are actually sown within London. They're not about competition with other places in this country. It's about um, elsewhere. I would name particularly housing. Mm -hmm. And I think at the moment our housing economy, for want of a better term, is holding the whole nation to ransom. We're going to have to face into the uh, great issue of accumulated housing wealth in London yep. and the South East. Mm -hmm. The only way you can do something about that is to make it in the interests of the South East to actually pay more taxes for the huge property wealth that exists yep. here. If they benefit from that, I can see that they might actually do something around that. That would then free up the rest of the country. But I think for the whole nation's benefit, you've got to unlock the London housing problem. Yeah. Uh, and unless we do that, then frankly, we are going to stay on the same trajectory. One more thing, yes. I, yep. and that's to say that um, I think the other critical thing that has to change is the mindset in Whitehall. I think the way that happens, because I don't believe that sort of the Whitehall elite are in some way malicious or they don't care about the rest of the country, I don't think that's true at all. I think the way you do that is to have a very strong political platform going into a general election which says this is the way we need to see the economy, this is what we think are the drivers, however conservative or you might be sort of using Henry's kind of uh, approach or however uh, sort of risky you might be using my kind of approach, um, you need a strong political platform to go in and say to Whitehall this is what we're going to do, this is why we're going to do it and we run it for five years, we run yeah. it for ten years and say right this is this is, our, this is our best bet for yeah. growth, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But frankly, yeah. you've got to have that political platform. So two cautiously optimistic uh, perspectives, slightly different, but, but mm -hmm. uh, optimistic nevertheless on you know, where, we are, where we're going. Katie, in terms of you know, the future, for, I suppose, for the, you know, for the rebalance in the economy debate, or at least how that plays out, and just your final thoughts on, uh, on well, that. I think I agree with both the um, previous panellists. Um, if the current direction of policy remains roughly the same, if the future direction of policy remains roughly the same mm. as, 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 as it is now, um, then I think there's exciting possibilities to increase growth rates uh, in the north, but nothing will happen that will counteract uh, the, you know, the enormous dynamism of the very deep economy in London, and there will still remain significant both human and infrastructure problems in London that, that need uh, dealing with. Um, in order to substantially change the current situation, politicians will have to be, I think, possibly even braver than <laughs> you've just said. Uh, wealth taxation is definitely part of it. You know, part of this grumpiness is about if you buy a house as a young adult in one part of the country, then 20 years later you're a millionaire. If you buy it in another part of the country 20 years later you're not, and that yes. doesn't feel right, and we are totally unable to discuss this in our public discourse. Uh, and of course, if people get priced out of London, so they cannot go there, then you'll start to see very different economic activity elsewhere. So that's why you're mm. entirely right uh, about that. Um, I think politicians could also be much bolder in terms of where they locate their own functions. We've seen some fantastic back, uh, back office devolution and lots of really good examples of that. We've seen the BBC shifting part of its stuff to Salford. Um, but to be really radical, you could lift up some of the elite of the public sector and put that somewhere else, because there's a lot of other associated activity that, mm. that that goes with that, but it's convenient not to, so it probably won't happen. So the point being is you can actually do something really quite big to alter um, the broad trend of what's going on. Excellent. Great. Um, my thanks to my three panellists today, Henry Oberman, Katie Usher and Ed Cox. You've been listening to a Think Cities uh, Roundtable. Thanks very much. <laughs>